in the call to worship. At the end of Psalm 113, we read, I have trusted in your faithful love. My heart will rejoice in your saving work. Because the Lord has been good to me. Because the Lord has been good to me. I will sing to the Lord. This day and always. This day and always. This day and always. Let us worship. Let, Let us, us worship. worship. Let us worship. God, we express our gratitude in prayer and song. Doing so from so many places. 
we offer ourselves in dedication to the work of the church. For though we are not meeting in person, the work has never stopped. We trust your spirit as it continues to uplift our spirits, inspiring us in the work of putting, putting love, love first, first in, all, in things. all things. We offer these words in the name of the one who welcomed and loved us. Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen. Welcome to Cypress Creek Christian Church. I'm so glad that you are joining me for this service of worship. This is a community striving to put love first in all things, helping both individuals and families to live the love first life. My prayer is that worship, these kinds of experiences, help in some small way so that you, might be able to live more fully into that idea, putting love first in all things. I am thrilled with what happened this past Thursday, our Christmas in June event. And I want to give a big shout out to everyone that was a part of that experience. And even when the rain came towards the end, it did not dampen the excitement. And then the live stream that night not only went out to our congregation, but went out to so many in the community, hopefully building more and more excitement around the revitalization of the Centrum. And with that, I want to remind you about the congregational meeting today, Sunday, at noon, 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. You don't have to come to all three, just one. But it's a Zoom call, and you're being invited to think about voting, about some important measures in the life of our congregation. There is an online way of voting, or you can call in your vote, but it allows us to take that next step of saying, yes, we want to revitalize the centrum, and yes, we want to go ahead and, and put our signature on the bid for that building, and then the final part of it is to, is to take out a bridge loan. So as we are waiting for reimbursement from FEMA that we don't have to tell the construction crew to stop because that only causes the price to go up. And then I am so excited, and maybe somebody, some of you already saw this, but a lot of people think that with a pandemic, ministry has basically stopped, but not our care partners ministry. They're not able to host the program that happens here at the church on a monthly basis, or at least it did before the pandemic. It was a ministry alongside those who have memory issues and their, and their care uh, givers. So what did our care partners ministry do? They took it on the road. They took meals and games and activities right to the front door of our folks. And it was a really special day this past Friday, and I applaud all who were willing to participate in that ministry. This morning, we have something special. It is a children's moment being offered by our new children's director, Sarah Kaufman. I invite you to watch this. Hey everybody, it's Miss Sarah. Welcome to the children's moment. Today, I want to tell you a story about a man whose name was Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus lived in a town that was called Jericho, and one day, Jesus visited. You know what? Before I tell you the story, let's just watch the video. This is Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus lived in a town called Jericho. He was a tax collector, and nobody liked him mostly because tax collectors like to steal lots of money from people. One day, Jesus visited Jericho and everyone was excited, but not Zacchaeus. He was too short and he couldn't see Jesus. So he decided to climb a sycamore tree to get a better look. Just then, Jesus saw Zacchaeus and said, come down Zacchaeus, I want to visit your house today. So they did. After that, Zacchaeus decided to give half of his money away to the poor. So what did we learn from the story of Zacchaeus? Well, we learned that even though everybody in the town gave a big thumbs down to tax collectors like Zacchaeus, Jesus still wanted to know him. And what's the first thing that Jesus asked Zacchaeus? 
He said, Zacchaeus, come down. I want to have dinner at your house. Now having dinner, that's a small thing, but it showed a really big thing, didn't it? It showed that Jesus loves and welcomes everybody. And we can practice that same thing too, doing small things that actually show a really big thing, that God loves and welcomes everyone. Zacchaeus encountered a righteous individual. That righteous individual was often called the son of man. Another way of translating that is the model human being. And that encounter with Jesus forever changed the life of Zacchaeus. Keeping that story in mind, I want us to turn to the last couple of verses of Matthew's gospel, the 10th chapter. Because there we find some pretty powerful words about righteous folk and prophets. This is Jesus speaking. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. Here ends the reading. Will you join me in prayer? Allow this gospel text, holy God, to wash over us. Give us ears that hear more than the words, for we desire to receive the empowered message of your Spirit. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. I caught a story on the news this past week out of Peru. It was a story about a nurse named Elias. Elias, he serves in a, a village of about 700 people. And at the beginning of the pandemic, the only doctor assigned to that village left, leaving Elias as the only medical professional left. There are about 700 people in that community, and a high percentage of them have tested positive for COVID-19. In fact, just two days before they filmed the story, Elias tested positive. But he wasn't slowing down because he knew that if he did, many more people would die. Elias was getting frustrated, though, because as he looked at that community with such a high percentage of people testing positive, they were not wearing masks, they were not social distancing, they were still gathering in large groups. And so he got on the community PA and he pleaded with them. He pleaded with them, and yet they seemed to ignore his words. Elias, in my opinion, is both a prophet and a righteous person. A prophet is one who challenges us with words. A righteous person is one who challenges us with action. Such people are not always appreciated or respected or welcomed. Now, Elias, I think, was appreciated for the work he did because the community benefited from what he did, but he was not respected when it came to his words. People seemed to discard them, ignore them. Throughout history, prophets and righteous people have not fared well. Their words and their actions, because they challenge, because they cause discomfort, have often been resented and been met with anger. Prophets, according to Scripture, are not welcome in their hometown, and those who live their lives in a powerful and profound way, their life witness that causes discomfort, such people are often shunned or even worse. So what about those who welcome 
or receive the prophet or the righteous person. According to Jesus, those who receive, those who welcome the prophet or the righteous person, well, they shall receive the reward of the, of the prophet or the righteous person. We hear the word reward, and I think our ears kind of perk up. Oh, you say a reward? I think it's a little like the conversation that Han Solo and Luke Skywalker had when they were discussing whether or not they should save Princess Leia. Luke really wanted to, but Hans, he wasn't convinced. That's when Luke said to him, she's rich, powerful. If you were to rescue her, the reward would be better than you can imagine. To which Hans said, I don't know. I can imagine a lot. We like the idea of a reward. But the prophet in Matthew's gospel was John the Baptist. He spoke truth, even to power. And he was arrested. And he was beheaded. And the righteous person, the model person in Matthew's gospel was Jesus. And ultimately, he was nailed to a cross. So if I welcome, if I receive a prophet, a righteous person, I might get the same prize that they got. Suddenly, I don't know if I'm really all that interested in that reward. Now, the language of reward can be heard in two different ways. Yes, the reward of the prophet, of the righteous person, often consists of pain, injury, being rejected. But there's the other side of it. There is God's opinion on the matter. For God does not forget the prophet or the righteous person. As Paul says in the scriptures, well done good and faithful servant. Those are the words that Paul imagines God saying. But in Matthew 23, Jesus recognizes that not everybody's on board and welcoming and receiving the prophet or the righteous person. And Jesus is speaking you know, a few woes to the religious elite that he calls hypocrites. He says, you are the ones who build the tombs of the prophets. You are the ones who decorate the graves of the righteous. Even many of the religious leaders were not willing to associate themselves with the prophets or the righteous people. Welcoming them, receiving them, well, it carried a risk. When you show support, when you stand alongside and provide credibility, when you offer encouragement to the prophet or the righteous person, you are even taking a risk. At the beginning of our scripture, Jesus said, whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. There is this wonderful string of welcoming that ultimately connects us to God, assuming that one is willing to take the risk. But then Jesus goes on to speak about welcoming and receiving the prophet and the righteous person. That word receive or, or welcome literally means to take the hand. It's the same word that is found in Luke's gospel in the story of the upper room where Jesus had the last supper with his disciples. It says, then Jesus took a cup and then he gave thanks. He took a cup. The word there is, again, received or welcomed the cup into his hand. And in receiving the cup, he and all those of us who participate in that ritual receive what it represents, the sacrificial love of God. When we receive when we welcome a prophet or a righteous person, we not only receive that person, but we receive the person that that person represents. We receive Jesus and ultimately God. I mean, it sounds really good, but then we have to take into account the risk. James Forbes, 
served as senior minister at Riverside Church in New York for years. A while back, I heard him at a preaching conference, and he talked about how infrequently people push back against the messages that we preach. Yet from the waters of baptism to the Lord's Supper, we announce Christ crucified, and we tell folks, this is your model. Let it flow over you as you enter the waters of baptism. Let it become a part of you as you share in the elements of communion. And people say, okay. And then we tell parents, let this man, Jesus, who rebelled against everything and was executed for it, let him become the model for your children. And no one, no one seems to question it. Forbes asks, do people not understand the risk. There's a risk in, in being a prophet and a righteous person, but there is even a risk in receiving or welcoming. Because in doing that, in extending your hand to them, you are saying, I stand with this person. I show my appreciation and commitment to this person. Yet in his graciousness, after Jesus set the bar rather high, Jesus then gave an invitation that I find both interesting and beautiful. He said, And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, anyone who gives even a cup of cold water. It's as if Jesus wants as many people involved as possible. I hear him saying, welcoming a prophet, welcoming a righteous person will be risky. And I hope you might step up, but if you can't, if you're not quite ready to take that risk, you can give a, a cold cup of water to one of these little ones. It sounds to me as if Jesus is providing a starting point for everyone. You're not ready to be a prophet. You're not called to be a righteous person quite yet. Okay. Okay, maybe you can welcome them. Maybe you can receive them. Maybe you can stand with them and give them some credibility and support. Or maybe you're not quite ready to take that risk. Maybe you can start with a simple act of kindness. Lamar, Lamar, he was a character. He was in in the church that I served in Kansas City. He was a very short, round man who would shuffle in and shuffle out of worship. Reminded me a little bit of Tim Conway. He enjoyed reading 12th century mystics, and he would photocopy a page out of a book and leave it on my desk. He gave my wife what she, to this day, describes as the greatest compliment she ever received when it came to her dance. But one time when Lamar was in the hospital, I went to visit him. And as we were chatting, he said, do you you mind going and filling up that cup with some water and bringing it to me? Of course. And I went over to the sink and filled the cup up with water and I brought it and handed it to him. He took it from me and he set it on the table next to him and said, I wasn't thirsty, but I wanted to make sure that you got your reward. At first, I was confused. I, I wasn't following it, and oh, I jumped to the scriptures, and what an interesting thing to do. It was a teaching moment that even in the most simple act of kindness, there was a reward to receive. I am thankful for the prophets and the righteous people who offer their words, who offer their lives. I am thankful for those who welcome and receive the prophet and the righteous person, but I am also thankful for those who maybe are not quite ready to take that risk and are still willing to act with kindness, as as small and insignificant as delivering a, a glass of water might seem. I think it's It's Jesus' way of saying, I need you all. If you're not ready to take that step here, I offer you this. It may not be as risky, but that's okay in this moment. 
In my devotional earlier this week, I referenced Edward Everett Hale, who wrote those words, and, and you probably had heard them before, but he wrote, I am only one, but still I am one. I cannot do everything, but still I can do something. And because I can't do everything, I will not refuse to do the something that I can do. I love that last phrase, I will not refuse to do the something that I can do. When Donna and I moved into our first home together as a married couple, we were so excited. It was an interesting neighborhood, I must confess to you, and, and our first thought was, some of our neighbors are a little odd. <laughs> and then we realized how well we fit in that neighborhood. On one side of the house was a church, not the church I was serving. And on the other side was a guy named Steve. He lived alone, early 30s, I'm guessing. Well, he didn't entirely live alone. He had a German shepherd named Henry, perhaps the biggest German shepherd I've ever seen. Steve worked for an air conditioning and heating company. And it wasn't but a couple months after we moved into the house that I went down into the basement and I noticed that around our furnace was a big puddle of water. I kind of panicked. I didn't know what the problem was. I went over and knocked on Steve's door. I didn't know him at that point very well. And I said, hey, would you mind coming and, and taking a look? Sure, he said. He walked over. He took one look at it. He grabbed the drain hose off the side of the unit. And, and then he paused and said, now, what I'm about ready to do, we usually charge a lot of money for, and so we don't usually let people watch, but I'll let you, I'll let you see this. And he took in a deep breath, and then he put his mouth over the end of the hose, and he went, <laughs> and out of the other end came a bunch of gunk and water. And he handed me the hose, and he said, put a little bleach down that, and do it every three to six months, and you should be fine. And then he returned home. Steve could do all kinds of things, and I called upon him more than once. There were a couple of times when I was out mowing the lawn, and he came out with a couple of bottles of beer, and we stood over the fence, and even though I'm not much of a beer drinker, I accepted the gift, and we chatted for a little while. Steve was willing to share these little acts of kindness, and I think if you would have seen just one of them all by, him, by itself, you would have thought, no big deal. But there was a collective power to the many acts of kindness that Steve showed. I don't know if Steve was a person that ever welcomed a righteous person or a prophet. I never saw it, but maybe in some other part of his life he did. But he was willing to demonstrate kindness over and over and over again. God calls forth some to be prophets and others to be righteous people in the sense that they put their lives out there in such a way that it speaks volumes. God also calls forth others to receive and welcome the prophets and the righteous people as a way of extending a hand and saying, I believe in this person, I respect this person, I want to give this person credibility. Even the receiving and the welcoming takes a risk. So Jesus also says, if you're not ready to, to go to one of those places, I invite you to at least give a cup of cold water to one of these little ones. He's willing to create an entry point for basically everyone. And even though the risk level is different, just imagine that you've got a prophet and you've got a righteous person and you have those that are willing to welcome and receive them and give them credibility. And then you've got a much larger group that is out there with their little acts of kindness that may not be all that significant by themselves, but you put them together collectively. If you've got the prophet and the righteous person, if you've got those that are welcoming the righteous person and the prophet, and you've got a bunch of people demonstrating kindness, can you imagine the impact that the church can have upon the world? This is who we are called to be. 
And I think it's so gracious that Jesus sets a high standard and says, maybe some of you are called to be a prophet. Maybe some are called to be a righteous person. But if not, maybe you can welcome and receive them and to give them strength and encouragement and credibility. And if you're not quite ready to take that risk, let me give you something else to do. I think there is graciousness in being able to offer us multiple opportunities, different ministries, different ways of expressing our faith. And if we are all willing to step up, I believe that in the name of Jesus Christ, we can change the world. You join me in prayer. In awe and wonder, we meet you here, O God, who calls forth the prophets and the righteous. It is often a lonely place, a misunderstood calling that does not receive a lot of praise. For those who can, for those who feel called, may, may there be a growing number who welcome and receive these instruments of your gospel and in doing so, receive you, generous God. This following Jesus thing is not always easy, and it's definitely not as easy as some describe it. There's a risk, and without being rooted in your unconditional love and kindness, rarely will someone be willing to take such a risk. Yet you appear willing to create as many entry points as possible for those who wish to participate, participate in, in the transformation of the world. Let us not bicker over the gifts that are shared. For those who deliver their first cup of cold water this day might in fact be the most prolific prophet or the most inspired actor of righteousness two years from now. You start with where we are, Lord God, and then you invite us to take a step, to take a chance, and maybe someday take a genuine risk for the sake of the gospel. For at the end of the day, we must recognize and claim that we are all beneficiaries of a risk beyond our ability to fully understand, the risk that Jesus took for the sake of your love being made real in our world. We ask this now in his name. Amen. Here in this place, new light is streaming. Shadows of doubt are vanished away. See in this place our fears and our dreamings Brought here to you in the light of this day Gather us in the lost and forsaken Gather us in our spirits in flame Call to us now and we shall awaken We shall arise at the sound of our name we are the young, our lives are a mystery. We are the old who yearn for your face. We have been sung throughout all of mystery, called to be light to the whole human race. Gather us in the rich and the haughty. Gather us in the proud and the strong. Give us a heart so meek and so lowly. Give us the courage to enter the song. Not just in buildings small and confining, not in some heaven light years away. Here in this place the new light is shining. Now is God present, now is the day. Gather us in and hold us forever. Gather us in and make us your own. Gather us in, all peoples together. Fire of love in our flesh and our bones.
own. Going back to the story that Sarah shared, the story of Zacchaeus, for Jesus to just invite Zacchaeus out of the tree would have been a bit controversial. I mean, because Jesus recognized him, gave him some credibility. But then for Jesus to say, guess what, I'm coming over to your place for lunch. Oh boy, the, the talk would have been throughout town. Because, well, folks didn't like tax collectors and sure did not want somebody like Jesus having a meal with them. But that's exactly what Jesus did. He sat down, and by having a meal with Zacchaeus, he was announcing to the world that, guess what? This is a person that God loves in spite of what he has done. And in that encounter with such love and graciousness, Zacchaeus' life was transformed, and he was willing to return the money that he had defrauded from people. He was willing to, he was willing to give back. He was willing to show kindness. The scent of the candles attuned my mind To the presence of God in this place And the whispers of bread I take flight in the air Remind me of God's holy grace The cup that is lifted And the bread that is passed Are visions of hope which I lovingly grasp a taste of salvation And a pure celebration And a love that is given It's given to all And my senses are filled with the grace, hope and care That's shared in this moment of bread, wine and prayer And my soul is ignited And all are invited to come this table of love mm -hmm. This time of communion reminds my soul that Through Jesus my life is so blessed And the hope and the grace that encircle this place Erase all my sin I confess the bread which is broken And the wine which is poured Enrich me in ways that I've not felt before My spirit entwines With a love so divine, so divine And a love that he's given He's given to all And this table before me invites everyone To live in a new life, the love of God's Son Rejoice in the sharing and all are preparing to come To the table of love Oh, this table of love is gift from above love This table of love he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to his friends and said, take this and eat. This is my body broken for you. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup and he poured it out and he gave thanks. And he said, this is my body, my blood shed for you. As often as you drink this wine and eat this bread, do so in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, as we gather together in our own home, at our own table, we are filled with your gracious love. No matter who we are, we are always welcome. Challenge us as we go through our daily routines to extend this accepting spirit to those around us. Guide us as we offer our hand in whatever is needed or whoever needs it, no matter how simple the task may be. 
Before we share this meal, we unite our voices as we remember the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Gracious God, may your love and our lives come together in a life lived in love. May Jesus be our mentor and our model, 
and may the world see in us a life that is willing to put love first in all things. Amen.